Welcome to the new podcast, The Mick, a Luke, and a Mike, hosted by Billy O'Connor and Frank Pace. Pace, how you doing, Billy? The wonderful, my brother. What is this, a sixth podcast? I don't know. You know, who knows? <laughs> Let's who, not make it tough. I'm not saying it's a Roman yeah. numerals, Frank. It's not like VI. <laughs> 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 I just what, asked you what, What's VI? <laughs> <laughs> it's VI. <laughs> so, no big deal here. Yeah. Okay. So. He's going to be grumpy today. Right? He's going to yeah, be a pain in the I'm ass. I'm going to be a pain in the ass. Oh, you're you, pain in the ass. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're, we're on a sixth episode fifth episode 106 106th episode derek's being funny again derek just be there and work the uh machinery <laughs> do all <laughs> do do everything you do and you know we'll we're, we'll be the talent there's a joke <laughs> <laughs> um talent this <laughs> so we're on our fifth or sixth episode whatever it is and they're probably on our third different setup yeah because yeah. uh we're social distancing uh, we've, we're not going to be able to have live guests in studio. So we'll have Alex Borland joining us via zoom right here on the, uh, on the camera in the set. And, uh, for those out there who are uninitiated, Alex Borland is a winner of amazing race. Won a million bucks by the way. And, uh, took that and Paul laid it into a pretty good career. Yeah. I mean, now he's a producer of the world's toughest race. Yeah. So uh, he wasn't uh, he hasn't, like Andy Warhol's fifteen minutes of fame. He nope. parlayed it into he threw the dice. Yep. So he'll be he'll be joining us in about 10, 15 minutes or so. Pretty cool. Uh, I'm I'm noticing this fireman's helmet on the uh, center stage on our table. Well, it didn't just materialize. Frank. <laughs> <laughs> you told me to bring the damn thing. <laughs> True. So, well, what, one of the reasons we have the helmet is because September 11th is coming up. But you're a fireman. Yeah, yeah Bill, you're a fireman. So you have to tell the people that you spent 20 years in the fire department. Um, and uh, why don't you tell me? A well, bit yeah, about but we're going to have our 9 11 episode, obviously, two weeks from now. And uh, Frank asked me to bring my helmet in. And my helmet, like any firefighter, you know, like. Uh, the helmet is an indication of what they, where they've been, where they've, what they've done. If you walk, if, as a lieutenant, a covering lieutenant walked into a busy firehouse with a clean helmet, it'd be like a football player without mud on his uniform. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, where has he been? What has he done? So guys take pride in if their helmet is crusty or what they call alligator stains. So let me ask you, how hot does it have to get to melt one of these? Well. And what are There's, alligator stains? Were, oh, alligator stains are the little uh, little squares that you see on any kind of fire. Matter of fact, fire marshals, when they investigate arson or anything, after something burns down, you see those little squares all over the place. When they get bigger or smaller, I don't, I don't remember the source of the fire. But when, you ha when your helmet gets melted down like that, it's like a 50 mission crush, you know? You know what a 50 mission crush is in World War II? Guys no. that were flyers. Okay. And they took their, their flying hat and they used to bend it down. Mm -hmm. And they weren't supposedly allowed to do that after fully they flew 50 missions. So if you've got a beat up helmet and you walk into a your cover lieutenant, you walk into a firehouse, guys will say, Well, where'd you work, Lou? It's the first thing they ask you anyway. Where'd you work, Lou? Because you could be in busy houses, you could have been in a slow house. If you're in a slow house, guys are gonna say, hey, you gotta watch this guy, he's from Staten Island. You know, like well, if you're from the Bronx or Harlem, they're gonna say, Okay, this guy. And if a helmet is all beat up, they're going to say, well, this guy's seen some action. But I listen, I I just worked in a busy house. But the firefighters there, some of those guys were amazing. I, I got on a job in 79, and that was after the real war years, they call them, in the South Bronx and Harlem. Because in the early 70s, uh, you, the Bronx was burning. I mean, it was burning. And so was Harlem, and so was parts of Brooklyn, uh, real busy places. Uh, when I got on, I went to the busy house, but those guys, I was in awe of the fight guys down there. They walked into a fire like you'd walk into a candy store because they were doing 11, 12,000 runs a year. You know, they, it was, those guys were incredible. 11, 12,000 runs a year. Yeah. Now divided by 52 weeks, 
that's I, yeah they were out the door 18 19 times a night 10 11 times during the day and and they were getting workers what we call workers it's one thing to go out the doors go out the door of false alarms and them days they had the old pull boxes mm -hmm. And they'd get a lot of that, but uh, we had a lot of workers. I mean, they uh, because we had a lot of vacants. You've seen pictures of the old South Bronx. Mm -hmm. It looks like Dresden mm -hmm. after the fire bombings, mm -hmm. you know? You could go blocks and blocks and maybe see one building. Okay, so if let's say a truck goes out 20 times a night and 18 times during a day. Mm -hmm. Did they have... Do they have multiple trucks going out, or do they all go at the same time? Well, that's interesting. Back in the early 70s, in 73, 74, when the Bronx was burning, the house that I went to, 60 engine and 17 truck, was so busy that I believe at that time they were the busiest house in the world. Now, I'm sure there's parts of, like, uh, Detroit, you know, when, when it was burning bad, Beirut. I mean, you could take places like that. As a matter of fact, I had a guy come in. To our firehouse, he was an old old timer, just making a speech. He was in Germany during World War II, mm -hmm. and he was a firefighter, a German firefighter, World War II. You know what their mortality rate was? A hundred percent. I mean, they all died, every one of them. And then when the Russians came into Germany, who told you that? This guy, this this was an old timer. Like I was about. I thought they had no old timers. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this guy made it. well, that's, that's like the gospel. Then a mortality rate couldn't have been one hundred percent, could it? That's like, that's, like the, <laughs> that's like the golf ball. The golf ball that you can't lose. What the hell'd you get that golf ball? I fell. <laughs> no, but, so this guy said, and then when the Russians came into Germany, they shot anything in a uniform. So anybody that was left, they just lined it up against the wall and shot them. But so, this guy survived. This guy made it. Yeah. <laughs> Luck, luckiest guy, why would he, uh, luckiest why would guy he in lie? Germany. Why would he lie? <laughs> and he never killed an American. He was on the Western Front. Uh huh. Sure. <laughs> on the Eastern Front. He sure. never killed an American. So, uh, yeah, so the busy houses, I mean, the, the particular house that I went to was so busy that uh, they were doing so many runs. What happens in a fire department if you go out on a job and you get it? You go out on a run, and now you got say it's blowing out six windows, and you're going to be there for a while. What they do is they relocate a company from a slower place down to cover your area because okay. your area is going to be burning. So they got to make sure that that area is covered. Well, they were so they call that relocating. They were so busy. <laughs> the particular house that I went to, sixteen and seventeen, it was on 134th Street, uh, uh, 143rd Street. I'm sorry by the Triborough Bridge, that they actually reassigned another company. They 60 engine two. And permanent 17. backup? Yeah. Permanent. So so what, two guys, a truck and an engine be parked on the street while the other truck was parked in a garage, you know, the engine. Mm -hmm. So they were that busy. But here's what happened, which is great, which was really lucky for me because I was out of my mind in them days. I'm better now, Frank. <laughs> sure, yeah, I can, I can tell. I can tell. But uh, what happened was, now, let's say you're in the borough command. You're a captain in the Bronx, and you're a captain of a firehouse. And the borough commander says, okay, Frank, I want you to send, pick out one of your men. We're creating a new company in the South Bronx. Send one of your men. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to send your best man down there? Or are you going to send the guy that's been breaking your balls <laughs> that you want to get rid of, right? So they ended up creating a whole company of screwballs. <laughs> so when I got there, there was uh, there was only one company, but a lot of guys had remained from the war years. I got there at 79. And the war years probably ended about 76. But between 72 and 76, we were still busy, mm -hmm. but not like those guys. Those guys were uh, – they, they, I mean, like they they ate fire. I mean, they really did. They were great firemen. I mean, and, and nuts. So I don't want to I don't want to get too far into this because we're having a nine eleven show. Yeah. But how would a New York fire department differ from the California forest fires they have? I mean, the, a fire is a fire, but still, uh, you have to have tremendous respect for the the job that the California firefighters do at the same time. And how's it different? It's huge. I mean, it's 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 the difference is mind-boggling. Like in New York City, 
we used to break guys that were firemen's balls in Staten Island, you know, like they say they had a busy night. Well, they have brush fires, you know, so what would you have, a two broomer or a three broomer? <laughs> you had to put it out with three brooms, you, you freak, you know, get a job. But in the Bronx and Harlem, you're going to, in New York City, you you got every kind of structure that you can imagine. There's brownstones, there's row frames, there's tenements, there's sliver buildings, there's high rise, there's Queen Anne's, there's private Yes, I, I, I understand. Now, I came out here with the attitude like, all right, these guys are like, you know, like Staten Island. No, 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 no. I drove coming down uh, I-5, I guess, one after the fires last year. I drove for 50 miles, and it was black on both sides of the, of the road. I mean, these guys are serious, you know, firefighters. And then, of course, that tragedy up in uh, in Arizona, Prescott, you know, the guys that mm -hmm. the 13 firefighters up there that died. I went to their funeral out here and uh biden actually spoke at their funeral did a great job of speaking at the funeral but a lot of guys came down from new york for their funeral you know uh so yeah man i got a lot of respect for these guys because i mean this is a conflagration they don't get fires oh, oh what a conflagration oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> a conflagration yeah <laughs> conflag conflag yeah so i mean it's, they, they have enormous fires i mean at least we know when we have a fire it's defined it's going to be inside right. that one building right but uh there's a lot of fire companies throughout the country when they have a structural fire they do what we call surround and drown like they got a private house they put two hoses on it and they save the foundation mm -hmm. but in new york city that doesn't happen because real estate is so expensive that first is life. That's the number one priority, always life, and then property. So what we do is if we have a fire, let's say in a bedroom of a, of a tenement or an H type, we go through the door and we push the fire out the window. We don't stay outside and push the fire back in to burn the rest of the house. We try and confine it to one room to save property. Mm -hmm. So it's totally different. But every every single structure there's a different procedure for fighting the fire and it's like a football team it's like everybody has to do their job and if everybody doesn't do their job one guy screws up the whole operation goes out the window wow well wow. so derek uh do you think we can get alex on the line now uh and do you think what should we do should we run the uh video the introduction while you get him on the line and i can continue to talk yeah you guys uh Keep going, and then I'll I'll bring uh bring Alex in. But you're gonna run a video? Yeah, in a second. Okay. So I'm interested in, in uh, meeting Alex. Of course, you already know him. He, you're the reason he's here. But uh, as a firefighter, a uh, lot of guys I knew were fitness junkies. You know, because you, you got to stay in shape. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, to do the job properly. Like uh, I know a couple of marathon runners that uh, one guy actually went to the Galapagos. To run yeah, we had, you know, Warner Brothers is like a city unto itself. You know, they they even had their own fire department. Uh, and the guys on the fire department, now that, that's a cushy job. <laughs> I was just about to say, <laughs> what <laughs> picnic that must have been. That's a, that's a cushy job. <laughs> but those guys were always <laughs> pumping weights, trying to stay in shape. And, you know, we had a guy – uh, on our softball team, Vic Matuk. I mean, Vic Matuk was built like a brick shit house. Yeah. I mean, he was thick, and uh, they were always staying. There, but they, they didn't get much action at all. Oh yeah, that's some <laughs> job. That's like a fantastic job. That's I mean, what that's, everybody everybody wants to get that job. Yeah, I can understand why. But but it makes sense for them to stay in shape because what happens is obviously if you get a job, and now all of a sudden you're in bad shape and you're running up 14 flights of stairs and you're carrying hose and you got to put out a thing and your heart's beating like this, you're going to get a coronary. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to live to collect your pension. Mm -hmm. But guys, I mean. So you're living proof of that. Yeah. <laughs> I was never, <laughs> I was never in great Al shape. Alcohol, <laughs> drugs, booze. Yeah, uh, well, what are you going to do, Frank? You know what I mean? <laughs> we all make a few wrong turns. <laughs> You made more than your share. I went down a few wrong roads, but bad decisions make great stories, Frank. Yeah. You great guys, stories. Are you going to say that every week? Yep. Every freaking week, I'm going to run it into the ground. I promise. I'll tell you a story about Patty's Day. Well, should I wait till 9 11? Yeah. Should, you Get should off wait the fire department. We'll just talk about Alex because uh, 
this guy's going to be a very interesting guest. I'm really anxious to talk about it because I, it seems to me to be good at anything. And you can argue this or not argue it or agree with it, that you have to be a bit compulsive about the subject to be successful at anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be a successful producer. When you were producing, your mind was focused on that all the time, right? Yes. I mean, it has to be. To be a good writer, you've got to write. Yeah, but you do. You have to do all the work, but you got to be awful lucky. And Alex will tell you that he was also lucky, awfully, awfully lucky as well. Uh, we're all lucky. But I mean, I, I would ask Alex how, Alex how often he runs. You know, does he run every day? Because obviously, you know, he's in great shape. Uh, and you used to run every day, right? I used to run every day. I used to run five or six miles every day. You never know it from looking at my body, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I used to pound the pavement because uh, there's something about running. You're along with yourself for 25 to 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. And I'm wondering if – but it's a bit of a compulsion of the, the way this guy must train. I mean, to win the amazing race, he had to be in unbelievable shape. He must have had muscles in his head. I mean, you know, that's that's something. Let's check. Let's so check. I'm wondering if he's a compulsive personality. We're going to run the promo. Okay. Run the, run the intro? Well, here he is. Yeah, So, Alex Borland. So, we're sorry about that, folks. But, yeah, um, technical difficulty. Uh, awful. I mean, I, I, I'm not a technical guy, but we just happened to get cut out in the middle. But we're going to have Alex back in a few minutes. And uh, he was talking to us about uh, this concept he had as a young guy, 28 years old. Hey, hey, around. hey. There he is. He's back. Thank God. Hey, guys. He's talking about going around the world for free, which is an absurd con you know, concept, especially when you think about the bodies of water. You know, I mean, I... I can see hitchhiking, but you can't ship hike. We already, we already, did we already cover well, that? Well, we did, but then we got blacked out. So he was about <laughs> to tell us a story. He was about. Yeah. <laughs> Alex? I, lost, I, I couldn't hear you for a second. Okay. Now um, I can. Yeah, That's so right. we, we got blacked out, and I didn't get to hear the story about he got the aircraft that he, he was in. Okay, in so tell the South story. South America. Yeah, I mean, so big picture, the route, right? So we went, I got this jump from Santiago, Chile, over to South Africa. Amazing people over there, tons of great stories, like from diving with great whites to bartending with the Dirty Skirts down in Cape Town, which is a really cool band. And then slowly made our way up to, we were in Nairobi, when all those riots broke out it was during election time. It was super, I mean, first time in my lifetime where I saw um, just, it, it was a tough, 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 uh, tough economical and just social thing to watch. And you thought you were going to buy the farm there. You, you, were, you were nervous for your life. Yeah, I was, I was. And it was just tough to watch. Like, cause I literally said, I was out in the Maasai Mara uh, working at this camp it was beautiful and like we were you know I was hanging out with lions it was awesome and then in like two days I was in Nairobi and just the watching the polarization of the country it was super sad but it was eye-opening and I was right there in Haru Park I mean bombs were going off the whole city was like burning all around I remember and, seeing video I remember seeing video of that yeah and, and CBS interesting I, I, sh I shouldn't be laughing about this but now CBS has been following me but now they're really interested right because they have boots on the ground and so wow. I get in through a, a local newspaper that's actually, I'm staying with the guy who runs it. I'm staying at his house. He gets me in with some of his people. So I'm in Haru Park where a lot of this like stuff's going down and I'll never forget it. I'm sitting there and I'm about to, I do these stand-ups, right? Where I kind of tell the audience, like, here's what's going on. And our editor would edit that together. So I'm sitting there, I'm a generally overly happy guy and pretty excited. So I'm sitting there explaining like, okay, here's what's happening in this country right now, but I'm smiling. And I remember some news reporter from Sky News comes over and is like, <laughs> very inappropriate. 
reporting style that you have. This is a very dangerous and serious situation. I'm like, listen, I'm just doing a reality show here going around the world, <laughs> stuck in it. So, hey, look, we all lost a few people at Dunkirk. You know what I mean? Let's not let's not get upset about it. Yeah, and so they, they couldn't figure out because I'm sitting over here like smiling, which is a weird thing. And then, and so I lived in the airport because that became like downtown Nairobi and the airport became like two of their most secure places. I lived in that airport uh, probably a week like living in the airport. I mean, I could go in and out of security without anyone. Everyone knew me there. And eventually I got, it was just a crazy transition. Someone got me a flight to go to India or somehow I was going into India, but because we had to get visas last minute, we didn't know where we were going. And because everything's being shut down in Nairobi, they just gave us this like 72 hour landing permit. But when we got to India, those people weren't having that. So they're like, we're kicking you out of here. So Jolt and I just get out of this, you know, Semi war zone. Jolt Luca, Jolt Luca was your cameraman, audio man, et cetera. So it was the, the two of you guys on this journey, correct? Exactly, exactly. Jolt's now, like only me. He's part of every piece that I'm going through. He's kind of a character of the show as well. Now you're going around the world for free. Is is your cameraman? Can he reach into his pocket, or he's got to be on the he's got to be on the arm too? I got to tell you, he's. I mean, the rules of the game is that I money can never really touch my hands, right? right? So if I get up, if I get on like a, a boat, cause I'm going to have a job or someone hooks me up or something like Jolt can go buy a ticket on that. We boat. could buy him on. I got yeah, you. He, if I get on a plane, you know, produ- you know, he's buying his plane ticket. Right. And someone hooks me up. So that was kind of our rules. And, you know, it evolved as time went on, but the first season we were just, you know, we made our own rules up, right? We created this show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. The whole thing exactly. <laughs> wanted to tell the story of real people. Jolt and I had worked together on, on typical standard kind of hosty travel shows. I was, a, I mean, I was very blessed to be in that world, but I was kind of getting bored and I was like, how cool would this be to tell real stories? And that's where the, you know, the idea stemmed from. So we, he was with me every step of the way. I mean, I was literally couch surfing around the world. So every home I, he never stayed in a hotel. He was always with me. So he was, you know, a hundred percent part of that journey. Well, you're talking about CBS getting involved when they saw the war zone. I mean, the whole improvisation of the thing had to excite them. I mean, as soon as they, you know, you guys were ad libbing all the way. A hundred percent. I'll tell you a funny story. So this idea, and I won't go back and like how it kind of formed in my head, but I pitched this everywhere. Frank knows this. Like I pitched this all over town. Everyone said no multiple, multiple times, right? They're like, this is crazy. And so it was a woman, Ann O'Grady over at CBS that just saw, like said, Hey, this is really cool. This reminds me of kind of like when we cracked the uh, survivor, right? Something new that hadn't been done before. And she asked me what I wanted. And I was like, listen, at this point in time, if I could just get the, just getting CBS this morning or some news coverage so people knew I was doing this, I think I can pull it off. She says, come back next week. I'll get a meeting with the head of uh, CBS this morning. At the time, I uh, can't remember what that, but it was basically CBS this morning, the morning talk show. I sit down with him. He's an old timer. I t- pitch him my idea. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And I'll never forget it. I think, he, I think he might have had a cigar in his hand. He's like, there's never been a stunt I don't like. You got wow. it. Wow. Yeah. And that was it. And, and it was, and as soon as we launched live <laughs> from the plaza and they checked in with me once a week, without that, them, like that really helped like drive that project and really that new form of media because we were pioneering a way of delivering content. Like this is real in real time. We're shooting, we're editing all on the fly. So Alex, let me ask you, uh, it took you about, nine years between the time you won the amazing race and uh, around the world for free got on television, eight years, nine years, would you say? Yeah. So how much of that half a million dollars do you have left by then? Not all that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, you, you know, you split a half, you split a million dollars. So that's 500,000. Uncle Sam probably took 150,000 or so. Maybe a little bit less, a little bit more. So that left you with maybe three, four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I think I like made. I think I was around three hundred and twenty grand when I was done from winning the race. Like, okay, my- so w- w- you did a show about two years later called uh, "At the Chef's Table," mm-hmm. correct? I think now I'm uh, I'm my memory sketchy, but didn't Rod Carew appear in one of those? 
A hundred, we probably did, right? Yeah, I mean, appears uh, down, down in Orange County. I think Rod Carew and his wife appeared at the, one of the chef table shows. Yeah, it was, that, I mean, I it was that was with you know Pine Ridge Film and Television really got me that next leg after Amazing Race, where I fell in love with this business, being like, this is the coolest world, and you know, I want to play in it. So uh, that was that was the first show that got me going for sure. It was, I mean, it was a well, it, at 28 years old. No, he was going around the world. Yeah, he's 28 on around the world. He's 20, 23, 24 on After Chef's Table. Yeah, exactly. I won. I did Amazing Race when I was 22. I think I was 23 when it, by the time it was airing on television. So I was about 23, yeah. kind of coming into the business after winning the Amazing Race. So yep. just just let me tell you a little backstory. So I met Alex when he was a soccer player at J Jacksonville University. And, and like myself, our careers get bigger, the bigger we're out of school. So, you know, we were, you know, you know, I don't want to say, well, I can say myself, well, yeah, I was a, a decent goalkeeper. Alex was a decent defender. Uh, 10 years later, I was a all state <laughs> goalkeeper. Alex was an all state defender. You know, 20 years later, uh, he's probably an all American by now. Glory days. Yeah, glory days. But uh, I, I met him at Jacksonville University. Uh, Jacksonville advanced to the Sweet 16 in Division One. And uh, I went out to dinner with Alex and his parents. And we went out to dinner. And he said, I'm going to I'm going to do great things. And I said, Well, yeah, call me when you get to L.A. <laughs> So a couple of years go by and I get a phone call and it's agent Alex is Mr. Pace, Mr. Pace. It's Alex. I said, yes, Alex, how are you? He said, good, good. Uh, I'm coming to LA. I can't tell you why. Well, I said, you have to tell me why. Give me a little, a little clue. He said, I was on a show called the amazing race. And I can't tell you how I did. I said, you must have done pretty well, Alex, or you wouldn't be coming to L.A. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that. But he came out to L.A. Uh, and he I'm so proud of him. He, he, he's done a good job. For well, himself. he parlayed it, man. He kept I, going. I, I appreciate that, Frank. I was going to wait until the end of this, but it's a perfect time. I was going to talk about how how much you influenced me and the advice that you gave me. And I don't even know if you remember this advice. Right? Talk slower. <laughs> yeah. You still tell me that, which I need. <laughs> Frank said to me, I got, and this was after I got my first show I'm hosting, right? And this is at the chef's table. And I remember, Frank, you were like, hey, way to parlay the reality into a real show. That's not easy. Good hustle. And you quickly said, like, Alex, learn to produce, man. You want to be sitting here, you know what I mean, 20 years later, enjoying this business and the, and the fun that you can have in it. This camera stuff's only going to last so long. Learn to produce, and I to this day, I, I never, I took that very seriously. I, I, I remember my first, they're like, my first show. I'm like asking them to produce, like produce. I'm like, yeah, I, I'm supposed to produce this thing too. Frank told me, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I and I did though, and I, I I learned so much more, and my career has been so much better because of that piece of advice. I never forget it, Frank, and I pay that forward to every kid that I talk about now. It's like learn the whole business. He's always giving me good advice. I got to say that. He's a pain in the prick, but he's always giving me good <laughs> advice. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. At 22 years old, before the Amazing Race, before you won it, were you like in super shape? Were you like a fitness freak? Did you have any intention of winning it? Did you think you had a chance of winning it? I mean, I, I would say I'm pretty good shape just because I'm recently out of college and I was playing, you know, soccer. So I was probably in, you know, but I, I, I probably should have been in better shape even through college, really, when I look back at it. Um, but amazing race is less about being in the best shape as it is about not quitting. That's, I mean, honestly, it's, it's planes, trains, automobiles, and it's more your mind, I think, than anything else. Of course, my season, I, I mean, I literally won by running past the other team. It's the closest amazing race in history. I mean, I won a million dollars wow. by, you know, a matter of 15, 20 seconds, right? So if I couldn't run, wow. I wouldn't have won, right? So that, and, that definitely and, helped. And you start, where did you start and where did you end on the amazing race? So we you ended start, in San Francisco. Yeah, right? it's kind of fun to try to remember all that. So we started in the desert of Las Vegas, right? Then it was down to Brazil, Rio, and then we were off to Africa, Asia, Australia, 
New Zealand, Alaska, Hawaii, San Francisco. Seen a few sites. All yeah, Billy's seen is in Vietnam. It's like being in the Merchant Seaman for 35 years. <laughs> this guy's been, been everywhere. All, and twice and three times. All Billy saw was a year in Vietnam. I got to ask him. I got to <laughs> ask him. Now, you've been all over the world two, three times. I mean, I've traveled a lot. I mean, believe me, I've got a passion for traveling, you know? And yeah. man, what you've done is my dream. I mean, when I was a kid, I wanted to get on a merch just so I could travel. Totally. But I, I got to ask you, is, is South Africa your, your best experience? Would you say if you had to go anywhere? Would it, if I put a gun to your head and say you're going there two months, where would you choose? You know, this is like the quintessential question. I get asked all the time and I don't know the right answer. I don't know the answer. I would, and it all depends on what am I going for? Am I going for good? Am I going for a weekend? Am I going for a week? Right. I, but I tell people a lot and, and it's funny, you guys just brought up Vietnam. I tell people that want to like get out there and start seeing the world. I think Thailand's probably one of the best because oh, I, look, I speak Thai, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, it's, it's, I do. Like, Southeast Asia, the culture still Southeast Asia. Yeah. Like, there. I, and, the people are wonderful. The people are super friendly. Oh. It's super safe. It's cheap, right? It's not expensive. So you can go stay in like, it, you can easily get around. And I feel like that's like, if you're about to go really go see the world, start in Thailand, then work yourself in Southeast Asia. Cause jumping over, not to say, I mean, South Africa is awesome, but like South Africa is, you know, if you want to start trekking through Africa, that's a different ball of wax. Then Hey Alex, I, I, I'm going to pitch you a new show. Okay. Ex bar owner, ex drug addict, ex alcoholic, ex gambler, 72 years old, ex firefighter travels around the world. How do you think? I know this guy. <laughs> how do you think that would, how do you think that would fly? And maybe that, you know, it's funny because I, I want at some point in time around the world for free, will come back at the right time with the right partners. Right. And so I think we, I think we might have our next, uh, contestant for this billy o oh, yeah. billy o. i can't even i can't even find a bathroom in my house you want me to go around the world with somebody doing this with this book this guy's crazy he's been, he, he doesn't even have a ticket he's crossing oceans I you know what he's gonna do i think this might be our first season we have two people both you guys together <laughs> yeah both of us as a come to think of it i, I not to switch segue too hardly uh, to this world's toughest race the thing you're producing now which is an amazing Shot that Eco you parlayed challenge. into that, the Echo Challenge. I'm reading that there's a guy with Alzheimer's that signed up for this. There's another woman who was deaf that signed up for this. You'd be perfect. I'm telling <laughs> you, you have Alzheimer's and you're deaf. <laughs> talk you about balls. You, you talk about you could speak Thai. You can't even speak English. I can speak Thai. Don't tell me. I always wanted to know what the hookers were saying about me. I learned how to speak Thai. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what, what's she saying? She's saying this? What is she saying? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, you parlayed it into this, and, and I can't believe the people that would take a shot on this world's toughest race. It's like it's like eleven Iron Man, and you got a guy with Alzheimer's. Yeah, I mean, world's toughest race. You know, that was a show. That was Mark Burnett's show prior to like obviously the juggernaut of Survivor and Mark becoming Mark Burnett. So there was a show Eco Challenge. It was brought out of retirement, right? This was a show 17, 18 years ago now with Amazon Prime. So the budget's really nice. I mean, it's the, it was the biggest adventure show in the history of the world from crew, budget, scale, every type of operation. It was unbelievable to be part of that. And at the end of the day, the most humbling, uh, humbling experience for me as a producer because you're watching people defy every type of odd and ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And, and I always say, it's like, you know, their, their why was important. And, the, you know, the father, son, the Macy's, you know, he was a big adventure racer. He had done the eco challenges back in the day. He's a big adventure guy, but unfortunately has Alzheimer's. His son was supposed to be on a team competing to win that thing. And then when they found out during the casting process, his father had Alzheimer's, he goes, this might be the last time we're able to do something. I'm going to go race with my dad and get him, try to get him over the finish line. And so that story was just ripped. Extraordinary heart. people. Yeah. Did, Unbelievable. Billy asked me a question. Did, you, did he read that you shot that with 200 cameras? I would, I would have thought more, but yeah, it's, it's insane. Every producer, every, if you're out there on the course for whatever reason, you got a camera in your hands, right? Of course, there's different units for different things, but I would, there was more cameras. Everyone needed to have one, I think. And that's what's beautiful. That show is a tough show because you have 
teams hundreds of miles apart in the middle of the jungle, how do you capture this, right? How do you have the crew to follow and capture um, this at this level? And so if you're out there, if you're part of the production, chances are you got a couple cameras in your backpack for at any point in time when you come across the team. There was no other way to do it. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, it was, it was. I mean, you're in the middle of a jungle and you're crawling on the brush. The guy's got to have a camcorder or something, right? It's, it is, I would say like by far my two favorite projects I've ever been part of around the world for free and world's toughest race. And, and Lisa Hennessy, who's the executive producer of that we're she's one of my best friends and, and business partners. And we've done a lot of projects together over the years. So she's the one who brought me in to be like, why don't you come on board and be one of the supervising producers and help out here. And why don't you tell us a little bit about dream jobbing? What's okay, dream jobbing? You want me to segue into world's toughest race from dream. Day? Yeah. I mean, Lisa and I created, I got we created a company called Dream Jobbing. We did a couple of different things. We offered the most epic opportunities on the planet, like being a co-star with Rachel Ray, to being a backup singer from Michael Bolton, to <laughs> being an elephant caregiver for the country of Thailand, right? Like just really cool opportunities that people could apply for. And then, then go have that experience. We would film that. It would be turned into a lot of media content um, online, as well as the episodes of television. And then we parlayed that into just really creating an infrastructure for young kids um, especially at, at risk and underprivileged students to help them find the path to their dream career. So there's a lot that the company did and Lisa and I were spearheading that, that, you know, that project and that company together. And that's where we really, you know, became super tight. And then as soon as, you know, she was off in Jordan, I, I don't know, I'm going to tell her story here a second. She was off in Jordan thinking about eco challenge and texted Mark saying we should, it's time to bring it back. And, you know, a year later we're in Fiji filming it. And now so, so is Mark still involved? Yeah, oh yeah. Mark was there at the starting line, like camping mm -hmm. out with the people right beforehand. Um, you know, I think at the, you know, it's I think it was fun for everyone. I mean, so Mark's very involved. I mean, Lisa's out there, you know, the general running the show, but it was just so cool to have Bear Grylls as the host. And for me, a fun part about this, imagine I'm coming, to, there's all yes, there's a lot of crew members. But these people all know each other. They are all amazing race, survivor. It's all those types of people that are obviously going to fit well to be producing and shooting on a, on a show like this. So the first day I get there, I sit down, Lisa Hennessy, the executive producers here, we're outside in Fiji, and this gentleman sits down. I look to Lisa and I go, Lisa, like, how do I know that guy? And she kind of dismisses, like, ah, you wouldn't know. I don't think you guys would know each other. I'm like, huh? We start looking at each other. I'm like, how do I know you? He goes, I know you too, somehow. He's the camera guy who took me over the finish line, an amazing race. I hadn't seen him in 18 years. <laughs> wow. We were working together on the world's toughest race. So it was a big 360 in my career to be able to be working as a producer with all these camera guys. I mean, we would sit around and these are some of the best in the business. So we were like, Alex, remember when you were 22 just trying to win a wow. reality That's show. Cool. Well, I, 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 on this, really I, I, I guess like the firemen or, or brotherhood of firemen, uh, survivor and uh, amazing race winners and people like that. It's all a brotherhood of uh, people as well. Yeah, it's tight. It was it really It'd be a really real nice exclusive experience. club, an exclusive club. Let me ask you, with 200 cameras on World's Toughest Race, at least, the editing to put it all together, that must have been like the biggest part of the, the gig. I mean, how do you, you, you got to leave a lot on the floor. It's in, I mean, imagine. So I get back. Originally, I wasn't going to be part of the post team, right? I was just going into the field. And all of a sudden I get back, they're like, hey, listen, would you come into post and, you know, oversee a couple episodes, which, you know, it's not really my background, right? Like, it's not really what I do, especially at this kind of level, but I was excited about the opportunity and the team is like the best of the best. So I'm excited to go work with like Eric Van Wagnen, who's overseeing the post team. It's just, I'm working with like people I look up to and just, this is going to be great. It was, no, and no one had like a script, like, oh, this is how you do it. Right. So every producer was overseeing two different episodes. So I oversaw episode four and nine. And so I just had to like, I literally sat back for weeks. Fortunately, there was the budget to be able to have the time to do this right. But I, it probably took me two or three weeks just to get eyes on most of like the main cameras. Right. So I could start like, okay, I got a little bit over here. I got a little bit over there because you got these feature teams, but I got to tell a story in 43, 50 minutes. Right. And that's over 60 teams that are spread out wow. over all this content, all this area. So it's all about like, 
oh, cool. I got the Kukuri, you know, twins. This is happening to them there. Camera got picked up and their like knee got bashed and I got them over here, you know, whatever. So it's like, you're trying to find these like 30 second stories that somehow can like come together. And what? sometimes you might have the start of a story, but you don't have the end. And so fortunately, you know, with my background with around the world for free and, and I'm really got my start doing a lot of online short form content. I think it played well into this role because that's really what you're doing. You're finding like 20 second, 30 second minute stories and then somehow trying to pull them all together into your episodes arc, which all of a sudden goes into the, um, the, the, the season arc. So it was, I, I think, I don't know exactly, you'd have to ask the post people, but I think we had, we had a lot of time. I mean, it was a lot of people. So when I tell people how many hours of my time, you know, tons of other producers, like helping out editors, everything that went in to watch those 43 minutes of that episode. Wow. Months, so let me, let, let me ask you three months of work of a lot of people. Let me ask you a question, Alex, uh, in a, in the documentary film form, uh, does the editor have the first cut? Do you, do, do you give all the footage to the editor and does the editor try to tell us the first story and then you come in and you see, you see what he missed and what he, what he could have done better. Uh, how does that work? Yeah, and absolutely. And, and it's interesting. And I think for every episode here, of course, it's like, I mean, the mandate when I walked in was like, Alex, tell the best story possible, like find the best stuff. Right. So, um, and every, everyone's a little different. There's some producers out there kind of like putting together, like, you know, editing on the fly. I sat back and watched, I'm not an editor. So I kind of sat back and took time and just had, I had this Excel spreadsheet that was like insanely massive that at least made sense for my brain to start like a jotting down notes, knowing what time of day, how I could map things out. So it was probably two or three weeks of just doing that before I even could say, you know what? I know I got this. I know I got that go back and watch it a little bit. What I was doing is putting buckets together saying, here's, you know, the, I'm just going to make this up, but like, here's the, the Macy team, right? They're, they're doing that. They're stuck you on the middle of the river and they are, you know, their thing breaks down. They're building. Yeah, you're down. doing, you're doing vignettes. Exactly. I'm putting, I'm saying, I'm telling them where the content is. I'm like, here it is. Here's the goods, right? Let's kind of cut that into like 30 seconds. Boom. They're cutting that. And so that's how we kind of get through the first pass. And then that, you know, we're probably looking at week five, six before we're saying, all right, all these vignettes, you got your board, right? Of how you think all this is going to flow. And, and you're just sitting there waiting because you got the executive producers that, you know, you're going to sit down there with them at one point in time and you're putting it all together, looking at it, maybe shifting some things around. So it's a true collaboration um, with some very talented teams. And I, well, for me, I always want to give the credit to the editors because most of the time- absolutely. I'm like, this is where my thought is, right? Mm -hmm. I'm giving it to them. What they came back with is like way better than I thought, right? And so well, I'm not there to be sitting there saying, hey, I think we should, you know, we talk about it after it's cut, but I'm, I'm putting them on the, the gold, letting them do what they do to tell that story. Well, obviously you can't smack the viewer around with a ton of vignettes from here to here to jump to jump. You need the continuity. How much ended up on the floor? I mean, how much was cut, would you say, out of all that footage? When you took 200 cameras, I'm hundreds thinking... Of, hundreds of hours of footage. <laughs> hundreds, right? A percentage, hundreds 80, 80% percent oh, no, he the can't, floor? He can't put a percentage on it. Yeah, no. I don't even know. I mean, imagine there's 43 minutes, right, ish, 45 minutes-ish out of... So, interesting to know, for every episode, you're basically looking at one day. That's how we broke this up. Right. Except for episode 10. So for so for for my episode. Right. That was day four of that race. This is an event that's happening. Right. So I have from 12 o'clock midnight to 12 o'clock midnight the next day. That's my stuff. All these cameras, all this stuff. Find the story. Right. So and of course, you're working. I'm working with like episode three, which is day three, that producer a little bit, like where are you ending things? What's going on? As well as day five, that producer who's, you know, we're going to episode five. So you're kind of like chatting with them a little bit and you're making sure everything kind of flows together. But you have 24 hours of footage of hundreds of cameras rolling. Wow. Off, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I got to find 43 minutes and make a story <laughs> for that. And I shouldn't say I. Massive. Yeah. You, you can never say I. You're, yeah. That's correct. Uh, let me let me ask you about Steve Harvey. Uh, yeah. You were a segment producer on Steve Harvey. Well, I ran the field team. Field. You ran, you ran the field teams. 
So why don't you, why don't you tell me some interesting stories about Steve? Okay. First of all, I got nothing but love and amazing things to say about Steve Harvey because, and, and there was some stuff in the media prior to me taking this role um, that heard that he was, you know, tough to work with. I mean, he was the, I mean, he was for everything that guy, I mean, I think he has more at that time, which is a couple of years ago, he had more shows on television than the mm -hmm. history of anyone, I believe. I mean, really? he's really busy, I think. I mean, he had, he had the to his talk show going on, daily talk show. He had uh, little big Family shots. Family, family feud. feud, celebrity family feud. He's a daily radio show. Um, and there's something else in there. Anyway, he's that's a busy guy. So what happened for that? Um, a little backstory because he was so busy. Family feud was shot, I believe, in uh, Atlanta. Atlanta. Big yeah. shots, I think, was in New York. But they did. And this talk show was in Chicago. They brought, you know, he was too busy flying around. They brought it all back to L.A. So that was the beginning of this. And then my good friend, Shane Farley, became the executive producer of that. And he called up, and here's a funny story. His original <laughs> time when he called up, he goes, Alex, what if we bring around the world for free back, right? What if you come and like, let's bring you do, you do it 10 years later and we'll do it off the Steve Harvey show. That's where the conversation started with the Steve Harvey show. And then about a week or two later, he goes, you know what, Alex? He goes, would you ever think about coming onto the field team? I'd love to get your perspective because I'm not a, talk show guy right i don't that world's a whole nother animal to like learn and figure out because i'd love to bring you know kind of like the way you look and kind of run and gun and get stuff done i guess to our system and so that was a whole new system and we're i mean 187 episodes i think we do in the season got nominated for an emmy um but to me it, it once again frank it was going back to what i know how to do right right tell vignette stories right that's what's my job because mm -hmm. steve harvey's so good let's say we're going to get a bunch of kids on here onto the talk show that are like flipping houses as their own business. And let's say, which was one of the stories. And these like kids under 10 years old, flipping their own homes and making all this money. <laughs> I'd go into the field to capture that story. So I'd film that, do interviews, do all that, cut that back into our system and then tee it up into a minute, two minute vignette. So because Steve's so busy. Of course the producers are prepping him, but like Steve's so good. He's probably seeing that for the first time as the audience is, right? right. Wow. So it became more important because of the speed that we had to move that story. So Steve would look up and be like, oh, that was really cool. So the kids go out like, hey, you know, whereas he was, uh, so it was super fun. I really enjoyed the pace that, I mean, we shot, you know, we're shooting, we're doing five shows a week, you know? And so we're, we're, you're cooking. And for me, it was more of the learning curve of, I didn't get, I'm do. I have one job. I mean, it's probably hundred, 200 people working on that, you know? And getting this stuff into their massive wheel that's just cranking out content those talk shows it's it's a it's a grind but it was cool i got to go around the country and shoot a bunch of vignettes um i'll tell you some funny stuff about steve himself so we shot stage one universal lock right mm -hmm. and so universals are like you know it's in our backyard i'd go running there like before i get into the studio every day so early on, this is season one of it being here in LA, you know, Steve's like, hey, like I'll do field stuff, right? So I'm getting this information. Steve wants to go in the field. I'm like, this is awesome. You wanna go in the field? All right, cool. And we got this backdrop. So we were doing a lot on the universal, just that, that playground and, and in the park as well as the, the backdrop. So to bring Steve Harvey though, into that park, he's like, let's go do, we're doing these like almost like jaywalking, you know, like jokes or like man on the street type of interviews. Steve Harvey would shut that park down. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean yeah. it's like, yeah. it's like Steve Harvey is like six fives, got the mustache. Everyone knows Steve Harvey. And because he was so popular at that point in time, you got kids who watch Little Big Shots, they're running up to him. You got grandmothers who watch Family Feud. Everyone knows Steve Harvey. So what started out as being like this great idea that we'll bring Steve in the field. Bringing Steve in the field is not that easy. <laughs> it would literally just shut that park down and correct bottlenecks because everyone, I didn't realize how big I, mean, I know he's a popular guy, but that guy is a very popular guy. I mean, he, he walks in, as soon as people know he's in that park, it is like. Whoa. You didn't like, realize the problems it was going to cause. Like, it was like Frank with Tyson in Russia. Yep. You had yep. no idea. You're bringing Tyson to Russia and Tyson's Tyson. You know, this yeah. is crazy. Yeah, and he realized like how big he is. But I always appreciate that he gave it a shot. We quickly weren't doing so much with Steve in the field. But he was, he was a great, I mean, I, I, I couldn't say more about just, Steve Harvey as a person and his team, because a lot of his, you know, his teams there with them working as, as well as Shane Farley, who was running that show. It was super fun doing two seasons of that.
Great. So now you're concurrently with the Eco Challenge. You're doing a real estate show that you're hosting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I got I got way too many projects going on. <laughs> way too many. And uh, my wife tells me about every single day. Um, yeah. So this I'm actually doing ironically a great segment way with Shane Farley, right? The real estate show. We had a conversation with CBS talking about like, hey, could we develop a show that would um, work locally, right? But that could scale nationally. And we were talking about all kinds of different ideas and real estate came up. I've always thought it was interesting. Shane thought it was interesting. So it's, super, it's a super easy, fun show, but it's, you know, every episode features 10 different agents walking through a property, like a really cool property that they're selling like right now. So if we're shooting, let's just say we're shooting this week in LA, we're going in shooting this agent doing the walkthrough of their property. That's going to post being edited as we speak. The following Tuesday is delivered to CBS. It airs on the next weekend. So what you're watching is super current. So once again, guys, there's a theme like that I'm good at, right? Like shooting stuff, turning around fast, again, to the audience. And so we've been doing it here in LA. We're doing it in Philadelphia. We're doing it in South Florida. It's starting to make my brain hurt because there's a lot of little things to make this show like the workflow go and it's a small budget type of deal. But, but what's I, the I, actual premise? You got 10 people pitching houses, the same house. You pick the, the person sorry, who's not the best pitch in 10 different homes. So imagine it's a oh. really simple concept. It's an agent, a real real estate agent showing you, Hey, this is my house that, I mean, this is the house I'm selling. You want to buy this like, you know, sick house in the Hollywood Hills or house in Malibu. So it's real agents in the real homes that they're selling. And from our perspective, what we really love about the format as well as the, um, the differences, you know, these are regular people, regular agents, not TV people, looking down the barrel of the lens, right? Which is a different type of art, telling people like, here, let me show you this world that I have. So it's got a cool, I'm, I'm the host of it, just facilitating it. Like now we're gonna go, for example, if Frank was an agent, I'd be like, now we're going to, you know, the Hollywood Hills and we're gonna meet Frank Pace. And he's, you know, got this killer $10 million home that he's, you know, he's selling right now. So, and we just kind of bounce around the episode like that. So it's have, a- Have any of the agents ever sold houses? Ton, yeah, tons of sold houses from it. Yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, they love it because they're, you know, it's building their brand. It's giving them like- Exposure. Yeah, sure. exposure for them. There's all kinds of different benefits for it to be part of the show and why they want to do it. And from our perspective, what we're really proud about is every episode, sometimes there's repeat people in there, but like it's, we're working with new people every time we've got to shoot it in a short time frame. So we basically train real estate agents to look down the barrel, basically to be hosts, television hosts for a day. And I think the show looks great. Like we're super, right. we, we there's only like three or four people who touch the whole show. You know, yeah. And so it's a very small show, but I it's the only way to do it right now with COVID and being out there. We can't have crews, and so it's um, it's awesome. I love it. So a shout out to your your folks. Yeah. Uh, you're you're born in Massachusetts, right? Born on the North Shore of Boston, a small town called Georgetown, Massachusetts. Georgetown, Massachusetts. You've got a brother who's a screenwriter and yeah. a sister who's a producer, and they're Absolutely. both they're both very successful. All three are successful. And I have yeah. an older sister because like my younger sister, Alexis and Andrea, and they've all worked and my brother have all worked together, but mostly my, my two sisters are working together all in those faith-based films and they're like blowing up. It's super fun. Well, to see. they are doing great. They are yeah. doing great. And, and, and Frank's known my little sister, Alexis, cause she's out here and you know, I, I give her, cause I think hey, I've had a very blessed ride. We all know this business is not easy and the grind and the hustle that it takes to be successful out here is very challenging but I'll give a little shout out to my little sister, Alexis, but being an actress and then trying to parlay and not, you know, being a super successful actress and parlaying that in your forties into a successful, like producing movie career is not an easy thing to do. And that girl will not quit. And I, I tell people now, it's like, it looks all glamorous right now, but I've watched her 15 years cry many nights of, of tough going through this business. And so I give a massive yeah. prop to her sticking it out. Billy, Billy asked me if Alex was obsessive. Uh, Alexis is even more obsessive. Yeah. 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 Well, you strike me as a kind of guy because you got so many pans in the fire. And I don't know you, but I mean, just from listening to you, you seem manic. You know, like you're up. You know, you're, you're high. I'm like that. I'm always, I'm always like my mind. You jump inside my mind. It's like a bowling alley. You know what I mean, it's pins <laughs> flying all over the place. Really? It seems like you've got so many projects. You've got to be like that. 
Yeah. And I think it's been a lot of like, and I'd say like my biggest challenge in life, like the thing I work on personally is, is staying. Sometimes there's like a project like world's toughest race where that becomes really easy for me. Like that's really easy because it's like, here's your job, go execute it, Alex. And I'm, that's what I'm doing. Something like around the world for free, the hard work's getting it off the ground. When I'm at, that's all I'm doing. I feel like I'm on vacation. Yeah. It's the times we're like right now where it's like, I got a bunch of fire balls in the air, right? Trying to juggle them, trying to decide which one I should focus more on. I'm pulled in a lot of different directions. That's where, you know, I, I'm constantly trying to like become better because yeah, you know, it's same thing. I got a lot going on up here, but it's a tough business too, right? It's easy sometimes to say you should stay focused. I don't know if that's the right thing to stay focused on because there's something over here. So it's this balance of like keeping enough balls in the air but not too many that you lose them all. And I, I always have been constantly working or I'm constantly trying to figure out what's the best path in that. Yeah. But I think that's a creative mind. I would think that that's exactly what's going on. You know, there's a lot of things juggling around in your head. Like you could jump on a horse in your head and the horse will go in six different directions. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you take the good with the bad. I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm bad at. And at the end of the day, it's better for me to have a million things because that's the way I'm better. I'm doing really well right now because I have so many things going on. Yeah. They're slow and my brain, it's, it's not good for me. So sometimes and spe- after now being 43 years old and having successes under my belt, it's easier to tell people like, I got this. I'm just in a mode right now, you know, and I got to get through it. So um, yeah, I, but I'm, I'm, I've always been super hyper. I've always loved life. I thank God every day that I've been blessed in this business. I work really, really hard at it, but I love it. Like I love the fact that I get to do, I don't take this for granted. And I, I tell people, especially these younger kids in this next generation, I'm like, guys, like, I work really hard. Like I work really hard and I'm not like uber successful yet. Like I'm working towards that and I want to be, but my journey has been awesome and I've loved every step of the way. Um, but I love it. That's the key is like, I don't feel like when I'm up at night, you know, midnight working, like I love what that's I'm doing. not work when you do what you love. It's not work. So well, what's next? What's next? What's next for you? What's on? It's what's on tap? It's a great question. I got to tell you all these, I mean, Hopefully, you know, right now it's it looking like you'll be eco challenge, you know, world's toughest race is going to go to Patagonia for season two. So unless they're going to have to kick me off that show, like the, I'm like that kid that's never going to let go. So Lisa's stuck with me. Uh, so I'll definitely be part of that. Hopefully when that, if that comes, obviously COVID's changed everything, but the, I got to tell you, Frank, and, and, and like, I, I'm back to um, these little shows and I'm smarter than when I was in my 20s working on smaller shows. So the beautiful thing about the real estate show is like, I own that show with, with Shane Farley. And there's a number of other projects that I'm working on. Some are with Lisa, some are with Burton. And I kinda, I'm kind of i kind of going back to my roots of just doing smaller shows, um, but in a different kind of business model. And I'm excited about it. And I think that's, that's the next probably five or 10 years. Like do shows that I can own, that I can kind of have more control over, that I can hustle on my own and have. And then when you want to, you know, have me part of these big, you know, big projects and pay me for that, I'm all in. So I think that, I think I'm going to be staying out of the middle game, if that makes sense, guys. Like yes, whole, yeah. developing like small middle type of shows. I'm out of that game. I'm either doing my own little projects or I'm going big. Well, you're flexible and you're evolving. You know, you're doing, it's a dynamic. Life is a dynamic and you're, you're riding the flow. Yeah. And, and I tell you, during this COVID, it's, it's, it's been a horrible for so many reasons. Right. And I think there's been two different sides of this. I'm impressed. Like you guys got this thing. You guys are doing this off the ground. And I'm one of those people I've taken this downtime to work really hard. Like I, I, I have developed and now I have shows actually running that all happened during COVID. So it's been this time that we've ha- all had to reinvent ourselves, And that's why there's, Hey, listen, this real estate show is literally shot with two people. It's me and another guy, the whole thing. That's more money. That's like, more money for you. That's <laughs> more money. This, this is about diversifying revenue streams. Well, I got to ask you, the world's toughest race is moving to Patagonia, right? Because everybody's familiar with the downtown skyline of Patagonia. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, why Patagonia? Who picks this? You? Uh, you the guy know, said- you know, it's much higher. I, went, I went much higher than my pay grade. Lisa Hennessy, you know, she's the executive producer um, obviously there's executives at Amazon, there's executives at MGM, Mark Burnett, there's a lot of, you know, people involved, but that's a, you know, Lisa's the one who's the brainchild. This is her baby and she's out there. So she's the one who they've, they've went down, they've scouted a lot down there. Have you been down there, Alex? 
I've been down there pretty close, not down to where they're going. They're going pretty deep. So I haven't been down to where they've been at before. So it'll be a first for me as well. I think this one, it's funny because I have a lot of friends who've applied and, you know, now that's on Amazon, it's a big hit. There's a, I mean, there's, I think there's applicants from 50 countries around the world. Something and like it's on, that. it's on Amazon now, right? I could, I could go but inside. It's airing on Amazon prime. I believe in a hundred countries. It's insane. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So I can go inside my living room after I say goodbye to you and put it on Amazon prime. And I watch on the show Amazon prime world's toughest race, sit back, binge it. I watched the Fiji show and uh, it was fascinating. I mean, absolutely fascinating. One of the things that absolutely blew my mind is that two of the guys in the race, one guy had hypothermia Right. And the other guy was seat, heat exhaustion <laughs> and they were the same climate. Uh, tell me, I mean, yeah. I mean, imagine, I mean, we touched upon this before. I mean, you're going almost like, you know, 500, 600 miles. And this is insane. Right. And people are doing this off like with one, two, three, four hours of sleep. Right. So you sleep when you want. Right. You got to kind of make it to the different checkpoints at your time at, by a certain time. <laughs> so people are pushing themselves. And, you know, Fiji, sometimes, you know, you're down below the mountains. It's super hot and tropical. But when you get into the higher elevation and like some of those falls and that there's those pools that were chilly, it just, there's something, everyone's going to break at some point in time trying to get through this. Because this is, you know, they say it's an expedition with a stopwatch and that's really what it is. And so some people can have the body just, you know, body, our bodies are unique, right? And some people can be, you know, freezing, some people have hypothermic, you know, it, every every different type of thing can happen to you. Your, your partner could be dealing with completely different conditions, and different symptoms, even though you're in the exact same conditions. These guys, it, it is, it is, that is, it's brutal out there. Just That's such cognitive dissonance though. I mean, you're in the same environment. What, is that, One guy what, is, is, what does that mean? I mean, it doesn't cog, make any cog, sense. One guy's dying of uh, heat exhaustion and the other guy's freezing his ass off. I'm, I wish I, I, I've heard people talk about this before. I just am not as I've heard doctors explain how the body can just adapt in different ways in, in, but in short, in layman's term, it's like the body is under such duress, right? It's like, I don't know what's happening here. This my body's not supposed to push it to this limit. And that's why it just starts breaking down and everybody wow. might break down in different ways. Wow. That's a layman talking about it. A doctor could explain even more, but yeah, people can break down in different scenarios for complete different reasons. It's like, this should happen in cold weather. This should happen in warm weather. It's just throw all that out the window when you are pushing yourself to such an extreme over four or five days through multiple different topographies, little to no sleep through some of the toughest conditions. It's um, and we're talking about eleven days. Is that what we're doing here? The world's yeah, eleven days. You know, everyone is on kind of their own expedition, right? So there's the lead teams. You know, these are like almost superhuman people. I think that they were the fastest people were in and around like six days at the end, you know, there, there's 11. So there was a kind of a cutoff point to be, can you wow. complete the world's toughest race by a certain amount of time? And everyone's with somewhere within that spectrum. You know, a lot of teams drop out. I mean, day one, there's teams, you know, and obviously everything can't make what you see on television. But I mean, I rem there was day one, there was a team that's like, you know, you have a, every team has a beacon. Like you want out of your situation, you pull that and the Calvary's coming with the helicopter to get you out. There was a number of, there was a number of teams and one team I know very well. They were, they weren't even into checkpoint. I don't know, two or three at that point in time. And a storm came through, they were on their billy billy boats in the middle of the ocean. They were like, we're going to die, like pull it, we're out. So that happens throughout, you know, the whole course. People are just like, I can't. Yeah, that would have been me. Check, check, please <laughs> check. <laughs> I think I had enough of this check room service. Unbelievable. I mean, I, it, it, it blows my mind that there's so many people willing to put themselves through that. I mean, we're talking Iron Man times eight times seven. They're crazy. Yeah. You know, what's interesting in there. I think this is what's most fascinating about watching the people go through it. There's a different why, right? It's like, you know, those two girls, the Kukuri warrior twin uh, girls, they were like, we want to show, I mean, they've, they have done all top seven peaks around the world. So they are badasses in their own right. But they were like, we're just trying to show the message that women and young women in India, you can do anything. Look at what we're doing, right? The father, son with Alzheimer's disease, the, the wounded warriors, right? All those guys, ex-military had all been wounded are just saying like, we're still here. We're doing this, not just, you know, those guys, like we're doing this for our friends that didn't come home, right? Wow. We're doing this to show that we're still in the game. And so I think that that's the most important aspect wow. for us as storytellers to get across 
Yes, there's this amazing backdrop of Fiji. Yes, this is like just completely insane. But each one of these teams are doing it for a reason. They're mm -hmm. pushing themselves to this limit. Um, and they're going to go through some dark places getting there. Small person, big story. Yeah. That's what it's about. It's a yeah. storyteller, right? You got a small yeah. person. What is it? Stalin said one person dies, it's tragic. 10,000 people die, it's a statistic. Yeah. yeah. One person, yeah. big story, right? So wrapping this up, Billy, you have any more questions you want to ask I Alex? can talk to this guy all day. What are you kidding me? I have no problem. I wish I was still drinking. I'd share a couple of jars with him, you know? <laughs> Then I would have ended up in Tibet <laughs> or wherever the hell he's going to end up or South Africa. That just would take a few jars. But a fascinating character, man. I'm glad things are going well for you because, you know, it takes a lot of cubes to do what you do. You parlay, you know, your 15 minutes of fame and just kept going and you're still going. And you don't know where it's going to end up. And that's the best part of the journey, right? You do what you love. I, I so who cares? I, I think you're 100% right. And, and I, I try to tell myself that. A lot too, because you know, LA is not an easy town in a lot of aspects. And I tell like a lot of people that they're not from here, but it's, it's the, I'm getting to play in the best playground in the world. And I, I've always loved to travel. I've always loved to, you know, I'm a hyper kid that loves to meet people. And I've got to do this, fortunately, in this format. And so I always say that's why I work so hard is because I don't want to lose what I have. I, I, I respect what I have. I, I, I love what I have and I, I don't take it for granted. And that's why I work so hard because the day that I lose this, I'll be so upset because yeah. it's so fun. <laughs> well, well, Alex, I'm proud of you, pal. The world's uh, toughest race. And uh, I just like to say, uh, you know, my friend Jay Thomas, who was also a Jacksonville university graduate once said uh, this business, there's no room for any of us in the biz. We have to make room for yourself. And you certainly have made room for yourself. Congratulations. Uh, Bravo. You, Bravo, brother. And I've Pleasure always, and I always, and I was, I told it early on, but Frank, you've been a, a massive influence in my life. You've always had my back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I I come we, on. Frank and I have been, we have been, we have been going to lunch at Jerry's Deli for what, over a decade? Is it two yep. decades now? Yeah. That's where him and I, we split a Reuben and we kind of talk <laughs> well, at least once a month or try to do it once a month. And I, I appreciate those times together. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's great having you. And I look forward to your next adventure. Yeah, don't forget Thank world's toughest race, Amazon. Check it out. I did. And I was uh, really, really entertained, man. It's really a great show. Great. So thanks. Great job, brother. Thanks, pal.